So in this presentation, we're going to look at some of the methods we use in paleoanthropology, both in the field and in the lab. And they will incorporate a number of areas of the earth sciences or geology, as well as biology, and of course, uh, also archeology. span Earth sciences are really a core part of doing paleoanthropology. You have to know where you are in the earth's history, you need to know what kinds of rocks you're finding. You study petrology, which studies the origin and composition of rocks, which may be very important for correlating different sites or different levels. Might be important for determining the ages, might be important in determining where those rocks originated from, how far they were brought in. And in the case of stone tools, it might lead you to the spot where these early human ancestors collected that raw material and actually made stone tools. Uh, stratigraphy is obviously key, and uh, it's simply the study of strata, which is a Latin word for stratum is a layer, and strata is plural. But as you look at these rocks, you see that there are distinctive layers. You might see these in a road cut when you're driving along, for example, and you know that they have been laid down in a very regular fashion with the oldest rocks at the bottom and the younger rocks at the top. Now, these are not horizontal, as you can see, so they have been deformed by earth movements after they were originally laid down in water of some sort. Geochronology, that's really the study of, of determining the precise ages of geological layers, and usually you have to have rocks of volcanic origin things like volcanic ash or lavas that can be used to determine the ages of when that volcano erupted, which is a good estimate on when that layer was deposited and how old the fossils are associated with that rock layer. Taphonomy is a, a strange word to many of you, I suppose. It's a science of burial and preservation. In other words, animals that are laid down to die and fall into a river usually get disarticulated and spread apart. Others that fall into a lake, for example, uh, are deposited in a very quiet depositional environment and usually will be more articulated or associated bones with one another. And it's very important to know the conditions of the ancient burial, and I don't mean in the sense of a, of a, a ceremony, but the natural agencies of burial and preservation to say something about that sample that you're collecting. We're interested in past environments. Uh, what sort of environments our early human ancestors live in? How can we find that out? Geologically, we can go out and look at the kinds of rock types that tell us something. We can look at the kinds of animals that are associated with those early human ancestors and say something about the paleoecology or paleo environment. This is a classic sequence in the Rift Valley. This is a sequence in Ethiopia. You can see the horizontal layers of rock and just like making a layer cake at home. The first layer you lay down is the oldest and the youngest are at the top. So relatively speaking, we can say by looking at this sequence, if we find fossils at the top, they're going to be younger than the ones at the bottom. Doesn't tell us how old they were, but it tells us something about the relative ages of those fossils that we're collecting. The geological context is absolutely vital for understanding the fossil you've collected. If somebody brings me a, a fossil uh, in my university office and say, oh, well, I collected it somewhere out there in the Rift Valley in East Africa, it's almost useless because we don't know anything about the geological context. We can't say anything about the paleo environment, the paleoecology, the age, the associations with other animals. So it's terribly important that we know the precise place where we find these fossils. And you'll see as we go along how important that really is. Uh, we want to know the geological context to say something about associations with other animals or artifacts or other kinds of humans themselves. We want to know something about the conditions of death. Did they fall into a lake? Were they eaten by a crocodile? Uh, and so on. So stratigraphy is the key. Here you see a stratigraphic column uh, so at the bottom, you have the oldest rocks, and at the top, much younger. And if you look over to the left there, you see a stratigraphic picture of a particular locality, in this case, off our locality, 333. And you see at the top, there's a volcanic ash 
that's dated to 3,180,000 years ago. And where the red AL333 are is where we found an interesting collection of fossils. And below that, there's another volcanic layer dated at 3.22 million. So we can say that those human fossils and animal fossils found between those two volcanic ashes are between 3,180,000 years and 3,220,000 years ago, which is very, very precise. Well, how did those animals get there? What was the environment like? Was it a river? Was it a lake? And by doing detailed stratigraphy, looking at the detailed rock layers, and identifying the, the environment of the original composition, whether it was a delta, where a river enters a still water like a lake or uh, the ocean, uh, you can tell if it's a swamp or a lake or whatever. In this case, you can see in the white outline at the top, geologists have outlined an ancient river channel. So the fossils that, that were found there were, were deposited in an ancient lake channel. And what's interesting about them is they don't show much rolling or erosion, so that was probably pretty much where they died or only washed in a small distance. So that helps us tell us something about what's called the geomorphology, the kind of lay of the landscape. Now, sometimes we cannot find volcanic layers to date. Uh, volcanic layers give us these precise ages on the fossil discoveries, and we have to use other means like biostratigraphy. Again, that word stratigraphy. What that means is that there are certain index fossils that allow us to estimate how old the layer is in which that fossil is found. Think about it for a moment. You go out hunting fossils somewhere on a weekend, and one of you finds a dinosaur fossil. Well, we know dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, so you know that the layer that you just pulled that tooth out from is older than 65 million years ago because of the biological element that you just collected, which was a dinosaur fossil. So these index fossils are really time diagnostic, and some of the animals evolve very quickly, like elephants and pigs evolve very quickly and show different stages in their evolution. And when we need to look at that in more detail, we will as we work our way through this course. Now, we're interested in absolute dating, which is sometimes called chronometric dating. And that means trying to determine the actual age of a layer in a geological column. And the primary methods that we use are the radioactive uh, decay of certain elements in rocks. Now, we can't date fossils themselves because they're totally changed into stone, and there's no material in it that you can really date as of yet. So you have to date the context, again, stratigraphy in the context. And it's known as radiometric dating, and it's basically based on volcanic rocks such as argon dating. And here you see a close-up of an argon-argon dating machine, a, a method that we use to determine very precise ages that I'll explain in a moment. Argon dating methods depend on volcanic eruptions. And if any of you experience volcanic eruptions, we know things like the uh, in Indonesia, they're frequently volcanic eruptions because there are about 150 active volcanoes in Indonesia, if you can imagine. And in North America, of course, there are things like Mount St. Helens that have erupted. In Europe, things like uh, in Pompeii, when there was a huge explosion there in 79 AD. And those volcanic ashes contain important minerals, usually minerals that are very minerals that are very rich in potassium, like feldspars. And what you have is you have a radioactive isotope of potassium, which is the symbol of which is K, and it's called potassium-40. And that decays into a gas called argon gas. We have this in double pane windows, for example. It's an inert element. It's one of the noble gases. It doesn't combine with anything else. And it gives off argon gas and calcium. And you collect samples of volcanic ash. So if we went to Mount St. Helens, which happened just 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and collected volcanic ash, the date we'd get for that would be essentially zero because there's very little argon gas. Well, after the ash comes out, it's all melted, all the argon gas disappears, it re-solidifies 
with this radioactive potassium and the clock starts at zero again. So the older the rock, the more argon gas. You take a sample of this rock, you put it into a, um, some sort of a, a um, way to melt that rock and release that gas, and then you count the atoms using a special machine called a mass spectrometer. And the more argon atoms, the older the rock. Uh, and you can look at l the ratio between argon-40 and potassium-40, and you can get a very clear estimate as to when that volcano actually erupted. And it deals largely, potassium-argon dating, with whole rock samples. It has a whole series of limitations, uh, but it is widely used and actually provided the first age estimate for a fossil in Africa way back in 1960. Today, most uh, ge geochronologists are using something called single crystal laser fusion. Sounds complicated. But you take a single crystal, one of those tiny little crystals, a little feldspar, and you put it into a closed vacuum in a little dish, and you focus a laser beam on it, and you melt it, just like the volcano did when it erupted. And out comes the gases and water vapor and anything else that's in there, and by dating single crystals, you can get very precise dates. And that has revolutionized our way of determining the ages of many of these ancient events by producing, as I said, precise dates. And what we mean by precise in science is that when we say that rock layer is 3,180,000 years ago uh, old, that's plus or minus 10,000 years. So that's extraordinarily accurate for our work. As I said, fossils are dated in context, and if someone brought me a fossil and said, here, I found this somewhere, uh, we wouldn't know how old it is. We have no way of knowing how old that fossil was. So here again is one of these, looks complicated, stratigraphic column. Uh, this one's from Ethiopia. There you see it on the left as the geologists have drawn it with the different kinds of rock using petrology. And uh, on the right, you see the site. And there was a skull, which is labeled AL, I can actually write on it, AL, AL822-1. And that came out of a layer, probably up in here somewhere, and rolled down the slope and broke up into fragments. And we put it together, and you can see how beautifully complete the skull is. And we know where it is exactly, because right above the geologist is something called BKT-1. And if you look in the master column over here, you can see that the BKT-1 right there, is about 3,180,000 years old, about 3.2 million. So that's how we know the age of that particular skull. You've all heard, I'm sure, of carbon-14 dating, and people often ask me, do we use carbon-14 dating to date the age of these fossils? Well, carbon dating requires organic material, some bone or, or um, charcoal, or something that is organic in nature. Not that it, it, it's not a rock, okay, like a volcanic rock. And argon-14, carbon, I mean, uh, sorry, carbon-14 dating dates younger finds, less than 50,000 years old. So another reason we don't use it, because it doesn't go very far back in time. And the half-life of carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope of regular carbon, the carbon we think of generally as a building block is carbon-12 but there are certain isotopes of it, which are carbon-14, that decays into stable carbon and nitrogen. So after 5,730 years, half of the original radioactive carbon disappears. So if you look at the little chart on the bottom, at age zero, that's the amount of carbon-14. After 5,730 years, half of it's gone. And after another 5,730 years, half of that's gone. And you ultimately get to a point where there's just a trace left down here. You can't even measure it so that you essentially get zero years. And it is used widely in recent archaeology and uh, is very, a very useful tool that takes us back to about 50,000 years ago. I'm not going to get into details of different dating techniques right now. We'll talk about those as we move through this course when we have to apply it to specific places. But what's interesting about, say, carbon-14 
14, it overlaps with tree rings. So you can take a, a huge tree, all right, like a sequoia uh, tree that lives for thousands of years, and you can count the tree rings which occur every year, and you can correlate that with a carbon-14 dating. And uh, it, will over, it overlaps with a number of other things, like something called thermoluminescence and so on. So many of these dating methods overlap in time and can serve as a check on one another to see if you're getting accurate dates. Something you've probably not thought about is uh, magnetism or paleomagnetism. Since about 78, 780,000 years, we have been living in what is called a normal magnetic world. Uh, the, the, the magnetic field of the, of the planet has shifted. Today we're in the normal, which means that if you take out your little compass, it points north, because that's where north is. If you were, say, 850,000 years ago, north would actually be that way. And it flip-flops because of the molten core of the inner part of the Earth. And these reversals have been dated and calibrated very accurately by argon dating which take us back well into the time period that we'll be talking about a lot in this course, and we can use these reversals and normal periods to, as a check on the argon dates that we have. And some of them are quite short, as you can see, uh, just back here in the Gauss cron, uh, you have a normal, a reversed, a normal, and a reversed. And you can see those changes in the rocks. You take samples of the rock, out of the field, you take them into the lab, put them in a special machine, and it tells you what the magnetism was like when that rock was laid down. Now we're talking about millions of years in this course, which is not the easiest thing for us to grapple with. Even I have difficulty when I talk about something that lived four million years ago or a hundred million years ago. So how do you cope with time? How do you get your how do you get your mind around the fact that there's an enormous amount of time? Because we live, we're trapped mostly in five generations, right? Our own generation, our parents and our grandparents, our children and our grandchildren. So that's about 125 years. But how do we understand vast amounts of time? I don't know if this will help you or not, but take a thousand page book. It's a lot to read. Each page assign 4.5 million years to, about the age of the Earth, 4.5 billion years. In the first page, the first sentence, the Earth is created, okay? The first 200 pages of that book, a fifth of that book, there's no life. Fish appear on page 750. Dinosaurs disappear on page 985. Hominins appear on the last half of the last page of the book, and all of us, modern humans, appear in the last line of the book. And in the last word of that thousand-page book, everything from the first cave paintings 40,000 years ago up to today, to, to today occurs. So this shows you how little of that 1,000-page book humans have been around, and how little of the four and a half billion years of life of, of, of the age of this earth, humans have been around. So I hope that will help you understand a little bit better uh, the vastness of time that we're talking about, as well as the minuscule amount of time that we have been around. And in the next presentation, we're gonna talk about what it's like to actually be working and living out in the field, searching for these fossils.